As you already know, R comes with some graphing capabilities out of the box. So when you installed R, uh, you installed some basic graphing capabilities that R has. And these graphing capabilities are themselves pretty powerful. So let's start by looking at the basic graphic capabilities, and that's called as base graphics. OK, uh, so uh, we already know that R can generate histograms. And we know that the function that allows R to generate histograms is the hist function. right? So you can just say hist and give the, the, the variable which you want to be plotted. So in this case, I'm saying hist auto dollar acceleration. So that's a way to refer to the acceleration column of the data frame. Or alternately, we can just say hist auto comma 7 because acceleration happens to be the seventh column. And of course, you know that when we are referring to a data frame, you need to specify the row and the column. In this case, we left the row blank because we just put a comma here. We said nothing before the comma. And that means we want all the rows, but only the seventh column. Okay, And of course, at one point in time, you can plot only one histogram. So uh, you have to specify only one variable. Alternately, you can say, because if you don't want to say auto dollar something, let's say you have a data frame and you plan on using the data frame quite a bit subsequently. You don't want to keep on prefixing the name of the data frame. You can say attach auto. And then you can avoid giving the auto dollar prefix. Then I just say hist acceleration. Uh, R goes and looks and sees, oh, I don't have any variable called acceleration. Let me go and look inside this auto data frame and see if there is such a variable. Indeed, there is, and therefore it plots it for us. OK, so this is what uh, happens. This is the result you get if you plot it this way. Uh, if you plot it this way, it'll just say histogram of acceleration. It won't say auto dollar acceleration. Right? So because here we would have said. So this is the output from the first command. OK, uh, so that's how it, uh, it, it shows us the data. And of course, we have seen that by default, when you do a histogram, R figures out how many bars to create on the x-axis. And of course, the y-axis of a histogram is always the frequency count. So what this is telling us is uh, between 10 and 12.5, we have roughly 30 uh, rows with axel. That is, uh, we have roughly 30 rows with acceleration between 10 and 12.5. Uh, we have roughly 10 rows with acceleration between uh, 7.5 and 10, and so on and so on. So it looks like uh, the accelerations between uh, uh, it's actually not 10 and 12.5. It's something different because you see here this is, uh, you, know, you know, two and a half, uh, two and a half bar widths makes up 15. Okay, so whatever we know that the maximum frequency roughly appears to be a little above 120 and so on. So that's what a basic histogram does. Uh, and we also know that you can control some of the features of the histogram by saying, well, I want this is to be the x-axis label say x lab is acceleration uh, and you can say i don't want any title for the main graph itself main equals blank right that means don't give the chart any title on the x-axis just put the label acceleration if you do that you that's what you're going to get acceleration on the x-axis label of course y x is always frequency for a histogram and there is no chart title so you can control some of the features of this okay uh, you can also do uh, you know, instead of plotting the frequencies on the y-axis, instead of plotting the frequencies, you can ask it instead to plot the proportions, right? So you can say hist auto dollar mpg prob equals true. Notice now the y-axis doesn't have the, the frequency, instead it has the density. In other words, what it's showing us is for each bar, so you have a total number of cases, and instead of showing the frequency count, it is showing the frequency count divided by the total or the proportion of cases that fall into each bin. That's what this does. Okay. Now, on top of that, in this particular chart, we also wanted to show the a smooth line of the probability density. Okay. Rather than just showing the histogram alone. Okay. Uh, so what we do here is uh, we we add the command lines. And then density auto dollar mpg, and that is what caused this particular line to be uh, to be plotted. Now notice that when you issued a command called histogram, then what R does is it clears out the plotting area, 
and plots the histogram. Okay, whereas when you issue the command lines, uh, it doesn't clear out the plotting area. The lines command draws on top of whatever plot is there in the uh, plotting area. Okay, so that's a subtle difference between uh, hist and other commands that we'll see later, which clear out the plotting area and draw something afresh, and commands like lines, which just add on to existing plots. Okay, so we can also control other things in the histogram. For example, you can say uh, hist auto dollar acceleration, x lab, we've already seen this, main, we've already seen that, we say color equals blue. So the bars in the previous cases were not colored at all. They were just, uh, you know, only the outline was shown like here. Instead, suppose we want them to be colored, we can specify color equals blue. And if you want to control the number of bars, you can also specify that with the breaks equals 15. Okay, so now you see that there are more bars, there are more breaks, and the color is blue as we wanted. Of course, there is no title of the chart because we said main equals blank. And the x-axis says acceleration, acceleration because we said x lab is acceleration. Okay, so those are all things we can do with histograms. Okay, now sometimes, earlier we showed a histogram with a density curve. Okay, now sometimes we take data and then we look at histogram, but we might want to compare that with a normal distribution. Right, in other words, for our data, there is a mean, there is a standard deviation. Okay, this is how my histogram looks, but what does the normal distribution with the same parameters look like? Right, so if you want to include that, you can say that. Now for this, there is no standard function in R. Uh, I have written a function of, to do this, and that function is available in this particular file. So first you have to, what you have to do is to load this file and source it in to your RStudio environment. Let me show you how to do that. So I'm going to get into RStudio, and in RStudio, I'm going to go to files, and I see the file here, dar2ed hist with normal. Okay, uh, so let me close this here. So first thing I need to do is to click on that file, and when I click on the file, the contents of the file get loaded into this, uh, into the source area of uh, RStudio. Okay, so this is the function that I wrote to do uh, a histogram along with a normal curve. Okay, so in order for you, this is, as you can see, this defines a new function. Right, I'm saying it's a function. Uh, so this is creating a new function in R that doesn't exist. Now, in order for this function to be available for you to use, you have to source the function in. Right, so the function definition has to be executed by R. The easiest way to do that is go here, click on the source button. Okay, and then you see that it got sourced. Uh, it got sourced here. So the function is now available for you to use. Okay, so that's what I mean by sourcing in a function. Right, so first load the function into your editor here and then press the source button. Or alternately, you can just highlight the entire function and say run. Uh, effectively, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to create the function definition. Okay, but source is the easier way to do it. Okay, so that's what I mean by source in the function first. And then once you've sourced in the function, you can use it. So the name of the function is dar2ed.hist.width.normal. I just gave it a big function name because I didn't want the function name of my function to sort of overlap with anything that R already has. And I said, do this and for the variable auto dollar mpg. And then you see the uh, mpg data, which is the histogram. But overlaid on the histogram is a normal curve with the uh, standard mean and standard deviation of this particular variable. Okay, notice that on the x-axis, it simply says data and uh, y on, on the, the main chart, it says histogram of data. The y-axis, it shows as density, of course, because we are overlaying the normal curve on top of this, so we don't want to plot frequencies. Instead, we want to plot densities. Okay, uh, now if you can, of course, have complete control over the histogram uh, here, just like you had with other histograms. So you could say uh, uh, auto dollar acceleration is what we are doing. Uh, I can specify the X label. I can specify the 
the title for the chart, everything just like before with the histograms. So if you did all of that, you would see your data looking like this. There is no main title and there is acceleration and density. Okay, so this is a nice uh, cool trick that you can use if you want to show the distribution and want to show uh, the normal distribution. So sometimes what will happen is your distribution may be very different from a normal distribution. So in which case if you overlay the normal distribution, you it will accentuate the fact that it's sort of skewed. Alternately, in this particular example, uh, we can say, well, it looks like acceleration is actually pretty normally distributed uh, because you can see here, there's a very good match between the histogram and a normal bell-shaped curve. Okay, so that's just a visual comparison of how normal the data is. Okay, uh, so now let's take a look at some box plots. Okay, and again, this is something you're pretty familiar with. You can do box plot of the variable. Again, xlab is the label on the x-axis. Color is just the color of the box. And if you did that, you'll get a box plot that looks like this. Okay, and just to jog your memory, in a box plot, the box represents the interquartile range. That is, this is the 25th percentile value at the 25th percentile. This is the median. This is the value at the 75th percentile. Okay, so clearly what this shows here is that although the range of the data is going all the way from 10 to about 50, okay, you can see that the bulk of the data that is, uh, you know, 25 percentile, 50 per uh, half of the data lies in a very narrow band around the median. Okay, so that's an interesting observation you can see from here. Uh, these two values represent the minimum and maximum, but of course they are not truly the minimum and maximum. These are the minimum and maximum without considering the outliers, right? So anything that falls outside of these two lines is an outlier. So in this example, you're seeing this is an outlier and an outlier is a value that is sort of abnormally high or abnormally low. And uh, if the way in which our outlier is calculated for box plot purposes generally is any value that is above the third quartile by 1.5 times the interquartile range. The interquartile range is that minus this. So in this case, the interquartile range appears to be uh, run from about 30 to about 18. So it's about 12. 12 is the interquartile range. So this value is more than 30 plus 1.5 times 12 or 30 plus 18, it's more than 48. Okay, so anything that's above 48 would be considered an outlier and this apparently is. And anything that is below the first quartile by 1.5 times the interquartile range would also be considered an outlier. There don't seem to be any such outliers here because if they were, then you would have seen the points being plotted out here. Okay, so that's the kind of information that a box plot provides. It gives you a very good, uh, you know, very concise description or a concise representation of the spread of the data. Okay, now, of course, histograms also give you an, a good idea of the spread of the data, uh, but the two things show uh, kind of uh, the, the spread of the data in slightly different ways. Okay, so between the two of them, they communicate quite a lot of information. Okay, uh, so box plots, uh, uh, again, one of the principles uh, that we had discussed earlier, Tufti's principles of visualization was show comparisons, right? So here, okay, this shows some information about the distribution of miles per gallon, but, you know, it would be probably more interesting if you looked at comparisons, okay? So here we are going to see how, how does the box plot look for different values of cylinders. So notice what we are doing here. We're saying box plot is MPG tilde cylinders. Okay, of course you are familiar with this kind of expression uh, in R. It's called as a formula expression. So what we are saying is show me, G, uh, show me MPG as a function of the number of cylinders and show me a box plot of that. Okay, data equals auto. So this expression tilde sort of you can read it like y is a function of x Right, so that means that whatever is on the right hand side that will appear out the it's x, so it's going to appear on the x axis, and whatever is on the left hand side is going to appear on the y axis. Okay, so what we're going to see is of course this is a box plot, and therefore on the x axis you're going to have 
different numbers of cylinders one of the y-axis is going to be the box plot take a look at this okay so now what what has happened here is R took the data for every value for cylinder separately so it took all the three cylinder cars plotted one box plot just of the three cylinder cars took all the four cylinder cars and plotted a box plot of only those and so on and so on okay so now we are seeing a comparison and there's a lot of information here right so clearly you can see that the cars with the highest miles per gallon because that's on the y-axis clearly are the four and five cylinder cars okay especially the four cylinder cars they seem to be the uh, you know maximum uh, most fuel efficient cars the four cylinder cars okay that's interesting and you know least seem to be the eight cylinder cars which we can understand because those are probably the big powerful cars or uh, you know trucks or so on okay so that that's what you're seeing here and another thing that becomes very clear is that there are more outliers in the six and eight cylinder cars in terms of uh, you know fuel efficiency than in the other cars oh that's very interesting why might that be okay it's possible that there are some outliers in the six and eight cylinder cars possibly because sometimes you have very powerful cars meaning cars with very powerful engines most of the cars with powerful engines are big cars and big trucks okay but sometimes you have small cars maybe the sports cars which have powerful engines but the cars themselves are very small okay so therefore their fuel efficiency might be better than the rest of the typical cars of that category okay so maybe that's why you've got uh, you know some outliers here and of course also outliers on the upper side not on the lower side okay so that looks like that could be one possible explanation of what's going on there okay so these kinds of questions get raised when you look at comparative charts okay why are there more outliers here than here right and also you see now that uh, there is a clear trend in uh, you know in performance with the number of cylinders and so on and of course the spread also matters right the spread is much much higher for four cylinder cars and lower for some of the rest and so on and so on now why might it be higher for the four cylinder cars again we'd have to uh, guess at what is going on but if you look at some more things you'll you'll get a little more insight into what's going on okay now just a subtle variation of this gives us a little more information okay so now one thing you can see here is that clearly we are uh, specifying here uh, the box plots for various values of number of cylinders okay now we don't know how many we already know in fact that there are very few three cylinder cars there are lots of four cylinder cars and so on right but this box plot is not actually telling us how many of each of those cars are are there well suppose we change that and you can do that by doing this var width equals true okay if you do that then you see that the width of the box has started now varying okay and the width is proportional to the square root of the sample size which means clearly there were very few three cylinder cars there are many more four cylinder cars because you see this box is fat this box is thin right and quite a few six and eight cylinder cars but not quite as much as four cylinder cars but definitely more than five cylinder right so three and five cylinder cars are actually pretty rare in our data set four is the most common six and eight are also present in reasonable numbers right now which principle of tufties did we apply here right so the basic plot was showing us two variables cylinders and miles per gallon but by introducing the size of the, uh, the by controlling the width to represent some information we now added one more variable into our plot right so in a two dimensional plot we have successfully managed to actually show three variables okay and you see that there's there's information that we gained right just looking at this we we immediately know how many of each of these types were there at least comparatively okay so that's again applying the principle of show multiple variables in your plot okay so suppose we plot the number of cars uh, box plot by model year 
you could do the same thing and it's telling us okay for 70 there were so many etc etc you're seeing the miles per gallon right once again now we are showing comparisons and the fact that years is now increasing from 70 to 82 and you're seeing the data here right clearly you're seeing that there is a clear trend towards better fuel efficiency cars over time okay if you look at the medians you can see that it's sort of gradually increasing over time and if you also wanted to find out how many cars were there of for each year you could always do var width equals true and that'll so then each of these boxes will have different width and that'll be proportional to the number of cars that were present for to generate each of those individual boxes okay